what a tremendous honor it is to be here with all of you, to be here with civic society. Sustainable has to be the watchword of the day, of the decade, of the century. If it is not, we will not survive beyond the century. The week of September 11th, 2001, coincidentally, we went on our first TV station. We were broadcasting out of an old media center in downtown Manhattan. It was a firehouse converted to serve the community in another way, as a community media center. And when we went on that first TV station as emergency broadcasting with the closest national broadcast to Ground Zero, um, stations all over the country started saying, can we run democracy now? We would send them out by video cassettes. The FedEx guys would come and fill their sacks with video cassettes, sort of looking like Santa Claus. And I felt it was important to send them overnight because it was breaking news. And then the NPR stations in a town would say, could we run this? And then the PBS stations. And going from nine community stations in 1996 to over 1,400 today is a testament to the hunger for independent media, for independent voices. I see the media as a huge kitchen table that stretches across the globe, that we all sit around and debate and discuss the most important issues of the day, war and peace, life and death. And anything less than that is a disservice to the service men and women of this country. They can't have these debates on military bases. They rely on us in civilian society to have the discussions that lead to the decisions about whether they live or die, whether they're sent to kill or be killed. Anything less than that is a disservice to a democratic society. And when you hear someone speaking from their own experience, whether it's a Palestinian child or an Israeli grandmother, whether it's an uncle in Iraq or an aunt in Afghanistan, it breaks down the caricatures and the stereo groups and the stereotypes that fuel the hate groups. It makes it much less likely when you hear someone speaking who sounds like your baby or your bubba, your aunt, your uncle. I didn't say you'll agree with them. How often do we even agree with our family members? But it makes it much less likely you will want to destroy them, right? That understanding about who a person is, where they're coming from, is the beginning of peace. I think the media can be the greatest force for peace on earth. Instead, all too often, it's wielded as a weapon of war, which is why we have to take it back. And I wanted to look at one year in the last 20 years to talk about the movements that make a difference and how important it is that we have a media that honors them, that gives voice to them. You know, my brother, journalist David Goodman, and I wrote a book called The Exception to the Rulers. That's what all the media should be. It's the motto of democracy now, but it should be the motto of all of the media. Our next one was called Static. And the reason we called it that in this high-tech digital age with high-definition television and digital radio, still all we get is static. That veil of distortion and lies and misrepresentations and half-truths that obscure reality, when what we need is the media to give us the dictionary definition of static, criticism, opposition, unwanted interference. We need a media that covers power, not covers for power. We need a media that is the fourth estate, not for the state. And we need a media that covers the movements that create static and make history. At Democracy Now!, we have grown to the largest public media collaboration in this country, I think because people trust those voices they hear, hear going into communities, digging deep, going to the heart of the story, brought to you by listeners and viewers and readers who are committed to 
independent media, the oxygen of a democracy. You know, we are not brought to you when we cover war and peace by the weapons manufacturers. We're not brought to you when we cover climate change by the oil, the gas, the coal, the nuclear companies. When we cover health care, we're not brought to you by the insurance industry or big pharma. We're brought to you by listeners, readers, viewers like you who are committed to an honest, open media. Movements take all sorts of forms. Sometimes they go underground, sometimes they, they crop up in different ways. Everything you do matters. Movements matter. And then move forward to the summer of 2011, when thousands surrounded the White House, that ro ring around the Rose Garden, protesting the Keystone XL. Um, oh, who got arrested there? Naomi Klein got arrested, the great author who wrote The Shock Doctrine and This Changes Everything, Capitalism Versus the Climate. I recommend all of her books. It was her first arrest. Um, Bill McKibben, founder of 350.org, he was among those who got arrested. And then a few weeks later, September 17, 2011, was Occupy Wall Street. Thousands streamed into Zuccotti Park. Now, at first, the media didn't cover them at all. And we were in the media metropolis of the world, New York, and they were right there at Wall Street. Um, I remember when CNN, Erin Burnett, she first went on the air with her show uh, out front. The, one of the first pieces she did was called Seriously? Mocking the people who had taken over or had encamped at Occupy Wall Street. Now, the criticism of the media, why they ridiculed these young people, was they were saying, I mean, what do they represent anyway? Every issue under the sun. They're opposed to the death penalty, they're opposed to war, they're against income inequality, and they are concerned about climate change. And I was thinking, yeah, they're actually listening, the media. All of those things were true. But that wasn't its weakness, the movement. That was its strength. And they also said, why can't they decide on who their leaders are? It wasn't leaderless, it was leaderful. Let's move forward to December, to the UN Climate Summit that year that took place in Durban, South Africa. We attend Democracy Now! all of the climate summits, starting in Copenhagen, um, then on to Cancun, to Cochabamba, the People's Summit in Bolivia, Durban, Doha, Poland, Peru, and then finally Paris. And we broadcast for a week or two full weeks, every hour, uh, each hour that we broadcast, totally devoted to the climate summits. We are the only national broadcast in this country, uninterrupted coverage, inside and outside. You know, this year was particularly interesting. It was horrifying, November 30th, the attacks in Paris, you know, that killed the terrorist attacks, 130 people. And a lot of the national news anchors raced to Paris to deal with that catastrophe. But what was horrifying after is that as the UN Climate Summit was beginning, that deals with the fate of the planet, I mean, the Pentagon is the first to say that the greatest challenge to national security in the 21st century is climate change, climate refugees. Yet, all of those anchors left and came back to the United States. We passed them in the airport. So we were inside. And you might say, well, why do you go to all these summits? What actually gets accomplished? Why waste the fuel? Well, Maybe there are stalemates, but what's most astounding is what happens outside. The thousands of people on the front lines of climate change who come from every part of the planet. The kids from the Maldives who come to represent their islands that will be submerged. People from sub-Saharan Africa who are coming to speak out and say that the desertification of a continent will kill them. All of the people who are not usually given a microphone, demanding their voices be heard. So in Durban, at the end of the summit, an unusual event took place. The World Council, the UN Climate Summit, allowed youth to address the world body. 
And the person the young people chose was a young woman named Angelia Pottere from College of the Atlantic in Bar Harbor, Maine, where you get a degree in human ecology. She said, I speak for more than half the world's population. We are the silent majority. You've given us a seat in this hall, but our interests are not on the table. What does it take to get a stake in this game? Lobbyists, corporate influence, money? You've been negotiating all of my life. You failed to meet pledges, you've missed targets, you've broken promises, but you've heard this all before. We're in Africa, home to communities on the front line of climate change. The science tells us we have five years maximum. You're saying, give us 10. The starkest betrayal of your generation's responsibility to ours is that you call this ambition. Where is the courage in these rooms? Now is not the time for incremental action. In the long run, these will be seen as the defining moments of an era in which narrow self-interest prevailed over science, reason, and common compassion. She said there is real ambition in this room, but it's been dismissed as radical, deemed not politically possible. Stand with Africa, she said. Long-term thinking is not radical. What's radical is to completely alter the planet's climate, to betray the future of my generation, to condemn millions to death by climate change. What's radical is to write off the fact that change is within our reach. 2011 was the year in which the silent majority found their voice, the year when the bottom shook the top. 2011 was the year when the radical became reality. And then she quoted Nelson Mandela saying it always seems impossible until it's done. And she ended by saying, distinguished delegates and governments around the world, governments of the developed world, deep cuts now, get it done. And she walked off the stage and she was followed out by all of the young people in the room. And the president of the COP, the Conference of Parties, what the UN Summit is called, said, on a purely personal note, I wonder why we let not speak half the world's population first in this conference, but only last. She clearly had moved this remarkable audience. And the next year in Doha, I saw Anjali again. She was outside the climate summit. And I said to her, Anjali, um, will you come in to do an interview with us this year? And she said, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, I was banned. There was outcry, and she was let back in. But it is so important to understand the power of these movements. Democracy now.